The perplexing case of Hannah Up, a woman who has gone missing three times, is a mystery that defies easy explanation. Each disappearance seems to stem from a condition known as dissociative fugue, wherein individuals forget their identity and feel compelled to wander aimlessly. This modern-day mystery has confounded investigators and intrigued the public, shedding light on the complexities of the human mind and the enigmatic nature of memory disorders. Hannah's first disappearance occurred in August 2008 when she left her New York apartment for a jog and never returned. Despite an extensive search, she was not found until nine days later when an acquaintance spotted her in an Apple store, unaware of her own disappearance. She exhibited signs of confusion and disorientation, indicating a possible fugue state. Subsequently, Hannah was discovered in various locations around New York City, but her movements remained elusive. In September 2013, Hannah disappeared again, this time in Maryland, prompting another search effort. She was eventually located after wandering for two days, with no memory of her actions during that time. Once more, she exhibited symptoms consistent with dissociative fugue, raising concerns about her well-being and safety. The most recent disappearance occurred in September 2017, while Hannah was living in the Caribbean island of St. Thomas. Following the devastation of Hurricane Irma, she vanished without a trace, leaving behind her belongings on a beach. Despite extensive search efforts, including visits from her mother and inquiries into her background, Hannah remains missing to this day. Hannah's case highlights the baffling nature of dissociative fugue, a condition characterized by temporary amnesia and wandering behavior. While some speculate about her whereabouts and possible motivations, the truth remains elusive. Her background as the daughter of Methodist ministers and her exposure to religious teachings may offer clues to her susceptibility to fugue states, but the underlying mechanisms are still poorly understood. Throughout history, there have been other cases of individuals experiencing similar fugue states, further adding to the mystery. From Agatha Christie's mysterious disappearance to the bewildering experiences of Michael Boatwright and others, dissociative fugue remains a puzzling phenomenon that challenges our understanding of memory and identity. As we grapple with the unanswered questions surrounding Hannah's case, one thing remains clear. The human mind is capable of extraordinary feats and complexities that continue to elude our comprehension. Until Hannah is found or further insights are uncovered, her story will remain one of the most intriguing mysteries of our time. Dissociative fugue is a rare and poorly understood psychological phenomenon characterized by sudden, unexpected travel or wandering away from one's home or usual surroundings, accompanied by amnesia for one's past and personal identity. Individuals experiencing dissociative fugue may adopt a new identity or assume an entirely different lifestyle during the fugue state, often without any awareness of their previous life or circumstances. The exact cause of dissociative fugue is unknown, but it is believed to be triggered by severe stress, trauma, or emotional turmoil. Some researchers suggest that it may be a coping mechanism for dealing with overwhelming psychological distress or conflict. Others propose that it may be related to disruptions in brain function or abnormalities in memory processing. Hannah Up's case is particularly intriguing due to the recurrence of her fugue episodes and the circumstances surrounding each disappearance. Her first disappearance in 2008, shortly after beginning a new job as a middle school teacher, seemed to coincide with a period of transition and adjustment in her life. Similarly, her subsequent disappearances in 2013 and 2017 occurred during times of significant stress or upheaval, such as relocating to a new city or experiencing natural disasters like hurricanes. The fact that Hannah's fugue episodes appear to recur during times of change or upheaval suggests that there may be underlying psychological factors contributing to her condition. It is possible that unresolved conflicts or internal struggles related to her upbringing, religious beliefs, or personal relationships are triggering her fugue states. Alternatively, Hannah may have a genetic predisposition to dissociative disorders, as suggested by her mother's reported experience of a fugue state. The role of trauma and stress in precipitating dissociative fugue cannot be understated. Individuals who experience severe trauma, such as physical or sexual abuse, combat exposure, or natural disasters, are at increased risk of developing dissociative disorders. 
Traumatic experiences can overwhelm the brain's normal coping mechanisms, leading to a dissociative response as a way of escaping or coping with the trauma. In Hannah's case, the trauma of experiencing hurricanes and natural disasters may have triggered her fugue episodes as she attempted to escape or cope with the overwhelming stress and uncertainty of her circumstances. Additionally, the pressure of starting new jobs and adjusting to unfamiliar environments may have exacerbated her underlying vulnerability to dissociative states. The recurrence of Hannah's fugue episodes raises important questions about the nature of memory and identity, as well as the potential for recovery and treatment. While individuals experiencing dissociative fugue may eventually regain awareness of their identity and past experiences, the process of recovery can be lengthy and complex. Therapy and support from mental health professionals are often crucial in helping individuals navigate and integrate their experiences during fugue states. In Hannah's case, the lack of a definitive diagnosis or treatment plan highlights the limitations of our current understanding of dissociative disorders. Without a clear understanding of the underlying causes and mechanisms of her fugue episodes, Hannah remains vulnerable to future episodes and the associated risks of harm or danger. Moving forward, it is essential that researchers and clinicians continue to study and investigate dissociative disorders like fugue states in order to develop more effective diagnostic tools and treatment interventions. By gaining a better understanding of the underlying neurobiological and psychological factors contributing to dissociative fugue, we can improve outcomes for individuals like Hannah and help them reclaim their sense of identity and well-being. In March 2004, a man using the name Robert Cooper bought himself a burner phone. He purchased this burner phone with cash from a 7 to 11 near the University of Colorado Hospital in the city of Aurora. On the surface, it seemed he was planning to use this phone to find a new place to live. But in reality, he was using it for something much more sinister. Robert Cooper used this burner phone exclusively to call landlords who were advertising rooms to rent in the properties in which they lived. But he didn't use it right away. He waited more than 30 days to activate the burner phone he'd bought, aware that 7 to 11 branches delete their CCTV after 30 days. From the beginning of his murderous plan, Robert Cooper exhibited a scary amount of premeditated planning. Robert Cooper never made any other types of calls on this cell phone, either personal or professional. And he always made these alleged house hunting calls from different points of Aurora, presumably traveling in order to make them, ensuring that his movements were hard to pin down. This activity also made him hard to catch when he finally did commit his grisly crime. In his apparent pursuit of a new place to live, Robert Cooper gave several different pieces of fake information to several different people. One address he gave was a fictional address at the University of Colorado Medical School. A social security number he used was traced back to an elderly woman. A cell phone number he gave was of a retirement home. And, of course, the name he gave was entirely fake. Robert Cooper told potential landlords that he was an employee of Wells Fargo. He also claimed to be a newcomer to the area who was at the time living with his sister. Wells Fargo had no record of anyone in that name having ever worked for the company. And there's no record of anyone called Robert Cooper residing in that area. So from the very beginning of his alleged search for a home, Robert Cooper was expertly sowing the seeds of misdirection. He visited several different properties, one of which belonged to Al Kite. Al had a basement, which he rented out for extra income. Before killing Al, Robert Cooper visited his property on two separate occasions. It was only on the third visit that he murdered Al. Cooper told Al that he worked out east, but he was pretty slim on the details. What he was very clear on was that he wanted to move in as quickly as possible, and that he was keen to get things moving very swiftly. During Cooper's first visit to Al's home, Al's girlfriend Linda came by to visit. She was in a hurry to use the bathroom, so she excused herself. But before she could say hello, Robert Cooper made an excuse and swiftly left, seemingly unwilling to meet Linda. Linda later claimed that Cooper did not want me to see him at all. She caught Cooper's appearance, from the back, claiming that he seemed pretty average in height, weight, and build. He was well-dressed and carried a cane in one hand. 
According to Linda, Cooper had black curly hair. Cooper came back for a second visit on May 18th. He paid a security deposit, received his key, and signed a contract. He was ready to move in, and Al was happy that he'd found a new tenant, along with the money and potentially a new friendship. But things were just about to turn sinister. Four days later, on Friday, May 22nd, 2004, Al took his girlfriend Linda to the airport. She was heading away to Virginia Beach, leaving Al for a week. When Linda arrived in Virginia Beach, she spoke to Al on the phone. It was a short conversation, and Linda noted that Al was very quiet, which was unusual for him and unusual to her. It was a vast difference to a phone conversation they'd shared just a few hours earlier, in which Al was happy, cheerful, and talkative. Linda now believes that Cooper was present during this second phone call. If he was, had he already threatened Al? Was the call made moments before Al was murdered? Whatever the reason for his quiet mood, this would be the last time that Linda spoke to Al before his death sometime on that same Friday afternoon, Al was attacked and murdered. It was Robert Cooper's third visit to A.L.'s home. Cooper had asked Al for help in moving a large recliner to his basement, ready for Cooper to move and Al happily obliged, but this kindness might have been his biggest downfall. Police believe that Cooper struck Al while he was helping him to carry this recliner. He was likely hit in the head from behind while he was descending the stairs. Al was then struck again and subdued and tied by his hands and feet while lying face down. He was bound in a very unusual way, with bindings above the elbow, above the knee, and on the upper arm. These bindings completely immobilized Al, meaning that he could hardly move, even while being tortured and killed. Cooper took several knives from A.L.'s kitchen, torturing him with them for a number of hours. He was brutalized, having been stabbed in the eye, stabbed in the ears, and nearly decapitated. The bottoms of A.L.'s feet were raised, and his feet had been flogged and beaten. They were swollen, red, bruised, and cut. There was blood spatter around A.L.'s body, both on the floor and up the wall. His body was found face down. He was stabbed 22 times. Many details on A.L.'s condition and how he was murdered were not released to the public, but every police officer involved commented on how gruesome it was. It's very likely that the murder scene was even worse than what we've described. And worse than we might ever know. The methods of tying, binding, torture, and murder used were unusual, premeditated, and expertly carried out. The binding was tight, economical, and it rendered Al almost absolutely motionless. Investigators believe that Robert Cooper even used a thin rod to twist the bindings in order to make them as tight as possible. Either Robert Cooper had done some research, or he'd done this before. Some experts have claimed that there's evidence of fantasy and ritualism in the binding style Robert Cooper may have been a sadist, but as far as investigators could tell, there was no evidence of sexual acts. Regardless, A.L.'s death was shocking and brutal. But even more shocking were the calm, collected actions of Robert Cooper after he'd mutilated and murdered Al. After killing Al, Cooper cleaned his house, unbound A.L.'s ties, used A.L.'s shower, wore A.L.'s clothing, ate his food, and slept in his bed. For what's largely believed to be two days, Cooper lived in A.L.'s house as if it was his own, and behaved as if he was replacing the man he'd just killed. Cooper had taken lots of the evidence from the crime, including the knives he'd used, and left this evidence in the kitchen sink, which was filled with bleach. By using bleach, he destroyed the evidence, but by leaving these knives in A.L.'s kitchen sink, he also left intentional clues that he destroyed the evidence. Along with the knives, Cooper left behind some other miscellaneous stuff, such as the key which Al had given him. It's clear that Cooper was making a statement and that he was taunting investigators by allowing them to know that Al had been killed by his soon-to-be tenant. Cooper was obviously very confident that he knew how to get rid of evidence and very confident that he could mock investigators without getting caught. A.L.'s basement was the perfect place for a murder. It was well soundproofed, it was small, and there was only one way in and out. It seems that Al, who was by all accounts friendly, sociable, and well-liked, might well have been killed just because of where he lived and because he was willing to help Cooper move a chair into his basement. 
When police arrived on Monday, they found L, but they didn't yet find his vehicle, his wallet, or his cell phone. And they didn't find Robert Cooper. Robert Cooper was average height, average build, and average looking, as far as any witnesses could remember. No tattoos. No birthmarks. All he had was a slight limp, which only some witnesses had reported. Sometimes he was seen carrying a cane. Other times, he wasn't. It seems that Robert Cooper was adopting this limp only sometimes as a means of misdirection. Even his age was hard to pin down. Some of the landlords he visited claimed that he was in his 30s, while others said he was in his 50s. Even the photo fits produced during the investigation looked different to one another. One of these landlords claimed that Cooper spoke with a Romanian accent. This landlord was familiar with the language, so it's likely that her observation was correct. This same woman claimed that Cooper made the hair on the back of her neck stand up. According to this woman, Cooper spent a long time examining the windows in her home. Because of the bad feeling she got from Cooper, she decided to withdraw her offer to him. Maybe this decision saved her life. According to lots of sources, Cooper was strangely aloof. One of A.L.'s neighbors tried to say hello to Cooper when he saw him, but Cooper completely ignored him. In spite of this aloofness, Cooper wasn't shy in leaving behind some clues. Cooper took A.L.'s truck, cell phone, and ATM card. He rode to an ATM in A.L.'s truck and used A.L.'s ATM card to take $1,000 from his account. This amount was nowhere near A.L.'s limit, so it seems unlikely the motivation for murder was cash, especially since Cooper had already given Al a security deposit and half a month's rent a few days previously. This amount equated to around $750, so a profit of $250 seems a very unlikely motive for a murder. It's possible that Cooper only made this withdrawal to tease the officers he knew would be hunting him, and that he wanted to leave a trail, knowing that he would possibly never be found. While making this withdrawal at the ATM, Cooper wore a ski mask, which he also wore while driving a AL's truck. He knew that officers would see some of his face on CCTV, but not enough to identify him. Cooper used gloves during this ATM transaction in order to ensure that he behind left no fingerprints and no DNA. He also left the withdrawal receipt in AL's truck, which he then abandoned around a block and a half away from AL's home. He also abandoned AL's cell phone along with his own. He left these cell phones in places with large homeless populations where they could easily be found, knowing that homeless people would go on to use them, which in turn would complicate the investigation. In fact, one of the cell phones was found in a payphone booth where Cooper knew people would find and use it. In short, it became very hard to trace Cooper's movements and motives. Investigators couldn't work out who he was, where he was from, or where he'd gone. Some experts think he might have killed before, or might have killed since. But though investigators still haven't worked out who Cooper was, he did accidentally leave some tantalizing clues behind. Robert Cooper's Romanian accent is one of the case's most interesting quirks. And it might just be the key in the eventual solving of the crime. One of Robert Cooper's blood droplets was found on the stairs in A.L.'s basement. Investigators tested this droplet of blood and discovered that Robert Cooper has ancestry from the Balkan region of Europe. There are actual living people in the Balkans who have DNA related to that of Robert Cooper. So, that landlady who said Cooper had a Romanian accent might have been correct. But despite the accent, Cooper's American English was very good. He must have spent a large time, if not most of his life, in the United States. He didn't simply visit the States in order to carry out one murder, no, he must have been here for a while. It's very likely that a lot of people know this man, they just don't know him as Robert Cooper. But the case has other connections to the Balkan region. Remember the whole foot torture thing? Well, falaka is a form of foot torture used in Turkey and other countries. This method of torture is typically used to maintain compliance and extract information. Falaka is usually performed with a narrow rod, and there was a narrow rod found in A.L.'s sink. Then there's the binding? Hezbollah, an anti-Israeli Islamist political group with ties to Turkey, use a similar type of binding when torturing and interrogating their enemies. 
According to many states, nations, and experts, Hezbollah are considered to be a terrorist group. Turkey once had a huge Hezbollah presence, and it still has a relatively large Romanian population. Is it possible that Robert Cooper was from Hezbollah? Was Al in some way tied to Hezbollah? Or was Al simply an innocent victim of an ex-Hezbollah sadist? After Hezbollah lost a lot of their power in the very early 2000s, many of their members fled Turkey. Could Robert Cooper have moved from Romania to Turkey to then the United States? Despite all of this speculation, and despite some insights into his heritage, we don't know where Robert Cooper came from. Or where he went. Or where he is now. And so far, none of these investigations have resulted in any concrete evidence. Though the Balkan connection is interesting, and perhaps useful, it's been no great help so far. However, there are some other interesting connections and insights surrounding the case, including several ties to other murders. Some have speculated that A.L.'s employment history might offer some clues as to why he was targeted and that maybe his murder was committed by a hitman. Al worked in Algeria and in Massachusetts, Texas, New York, Nevada, Wyoming, Tennessee, and other places. Al had held jobs in the nuclear weapons field, holding accounting jobs at two separate nuclear facilities and in one similar facility in Algeria. One of these companies was an engineering firm called Stone and Webster, which manages laboratories. Although he only worked in finance, Al might have had some insights into some important information on nuclear power or nuclear weapons. So was Robert Cooper interested in learning some secrets? Or keeping some secrets covered up? This takes us to a very interesting detour. In 1999, engineer Lee Scott Hall, who worked for Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, was brutally beaten and stabbed to death while home alone. Hall's Adam's apple had been broken, his heart was nearly severed, and he was stabbed ten times. Hall, in the months previous, had noticed a person who he described as suspicious was following him. One time, he was followed home. But Hall was found dead before he could talk to the police about this man. Hall's son had been assaulted in his home two years prior to this murder, but the assailant's motive was never known. Hall's home had been ransacked but no items were stolen. His computer had been turned on, but it didn't appear that anything had been taken from it. His wallet was empty, but was left at the scene. Could this crime be connected to ALs? Both men worked in nuclear research and accounting. Both men were killed in very similar ways, and both were discovered by their significant others. Both homes were left relatively untouched, save for the evidence of a struggle. In Hall's case, however, police made an arrest. But this man, the police claimed, was incapable of the murder, and the case has gone unsolved. And could there be even more connections? David Walker, who had a degree in chemistry and physics, and was once a prolific worker in the United States Weapons Laboratories, was found dead on August 25, 2003. Walker had been a researcher at Sandia National Laboratories, and he'd worked in a lab which used pyrotechnics, explosives, and toxic gases. Walker's death was officially classified as a suicide by asphyxiation. Walker's wife was the one who found him. She later claimed that there was a lot of blood, though the authorities didn't mention this in their official report. The windows were locked, but the doors were open. A neighbor had heard some muffled voices. One of David's co-workers had visited him earlier in the day to ask him if he wanted to go out for a drink. Walker's co-worker said that he looked well, but that he seemed preoccupied. Walker's car was found on a different street, near a local shopping mall. A restaurant worker found the car around 9.30 on the morning of August 26th. According to the restaurant worker, the car had been there since about 4 o'clock in the afternoon the day before. David was last seen by his wife at about 1 p.m. Walker's wife said that her husband had been behaving oddly in the days leading up to his death and that he'd been receiving lots of mysterious phone calls. Walker's wife later said that he'd been receiving phone calls from a mysterious woman who'd been inquiring about their home, saying that she was considering moving in. But this woman had never existed. Walker was wearing his pajamas when he was found, but a bathrobe was found close to his body. 
Walker's wife claimed that the bathrobe didn't belong to them and that it wasn't there when she'd last seen her husband. Walker's work had been classified and he'd had to sign non-disclosure agreements. But after his death, several computers were stolen from his workplace. Walker's family later said that the night before he died, Walker had been extremely preoccupied and that he'd been going on about how he had to protect himself. So, with this new information in mind, was there a possibility that these murders were all connected? The police were quick to dismiss any connections between these three murders, and who knows, maybe they're right. Maybe the connections between these three deaths are nothing more than coincidences. But then again, maybe not. Perhaps Robert Cooper was interested in more than just torturing and murdering his victims. Perhaps he was interested in their work their secrets. And perhaps these men had secrets of their own. It's clear that Al was a tortured soul. But was he the tortured or the torturer? And is it possible that the other men, Walker and Hall, were both in some way connected to this tortured soul? Though it might seem like grasping at straws, it's very possible that these three murders are linked and that perhaps the reason why Robert Cooper has never been found is that the police are looking in the wrong place. In conclusion, the murders of Al Kite, David Walker, and Lee Scott Hall might well be connected. And though it might seem like a stretch, it's possible that Robert Cooper was involved in all three. Until new evidence arises, though, we'll never know for sure. But one thing is for certain. Al, David, and Lee, wherever they are, are still waiting for justice to be served. <laughs>